I'm Marty Stauffer. Even as a kid growing up in rural Arkansas, I was interested in photography. To me, it was some sort of magic. Our parents encouraged us to take turns with the family equipment, but I have to admit that back then it was nothing very special. I started taking still photos for the family album with this old brownie box camera. Next came home movies in 8mm, in the backyard, and then in the nearby woods. Before I knew it, I was spending the summer in Alaska and making a documentary about the wildlife. The 16mm Aeroflex equipment that I use today has come a long ways from this 8mm Kodak camera. That's not really the camera's fault. You see, at one point, this uh, telephoto lens was broken off, and I glued it back on. It never was the same after that for some reason. But some of my fondest memories are of the old days, when I was just starting out. And I love to hear from people who are in that same position today. I get some funny questions, though. One young man wrote and asked, if I'm in the woods, lost and very hungry, is it okay if I eat tree bark? Well, I advised him that I didn't think it'd be very nutritious. Somehow people have the impression that a wildlife cameraman is a cross between uh, Ewell Gibbons and Daniel Boone. But most of the letters that I receive are people asking good solid questions. How can I become a wildlife photographer? Well, it's an important question and I'd like to give you a quick easy answer, but there really aren't any. The answer is pretty complicated, but I'm gonna try to answer it. So why don't you come along I'd like to show you some of the scenes that I've been lucky enough to capture on film. And I'd also like to share with you some of my secrets for photographing wildlife. Scenes like these did not come easily or quickly. When we were young, my brothers Mark and Marshall and my sister Mary and I constantly filmed our backyard adventures. We had the usual domestic pets. Then there were some not so usual, including Foxy the Fox. The orphaned kit shared a food dish with our family dog. Through the years, that simple Kodak 8mm saw miles of film and a lot of animals. The larger Super 8 format was a step up technically but the fun of filmmaking remained as strong as ever. My interest eventually took me far beyond the backyard to a place that every wildlife photographer dreams about, Alaska. In 
In that summer, between years of college, I discovered the incredible beauty and vastness of our continent. Bush pilot Pete Mary helped make my dream a reality. For a country boy, fresh from the southern woods, the far north was endless. As I learned to live off the land, I also learned to film with a crew of one, me. That lesson is valuable, even today, because a wildlife cameraman is usually alone. In this sequence of fishing for burbot, I was both in front of and behind the lens. Watch as I stop the camera by clicking the switch in my right hand. It seems that most people enjoy a wildlife story with a person in it, someone they can identify with. So my cast of characters often included yours truly. All went well until a blizzard suddenly arrived in August. Not surprising in the Brooks Range of Northern Alaska, but pilot Pete Mary could not return. So I was stranded, out of supplies, and forced to hunt for whatever food the mountains could provide. The doll sheep ram I shot was more than welcome. It was vital. The meat kept me alive for three weeks until the weather finally broke and the plane could come back. The Alaskan film was a success with audiences back in 1968, even though it was silent except for my live commentary. It convinced me that there might be a future in wildlife films. So I planned for the next adventure, Africa. I persuaded a safari company in the country of Botswana to let me produce a promotional film of their operation, this time in the professional 16 millimeter format. Every aspect of the experience was new. The people, the animals, and the living conditions. Sometimes I explored without a camera, but never without a rifle. There was no telling what I might find, like this pair of lions. Fortunately, they were occupied with mating season and seemed unaware of my presence. Everywhere I looked, there were scenes like this, just waiting to be filmed. There was life, birth and death, the great herds and their predators.
Yet death was not always natural. It came also at the hands of man. Still, I could not turn away or stop the camera. Safari was the story of Africa back in 1970. Gentle or mighty, beautiful or homely, few creatures escaped the hunter's bullet. In Alaska, I had accepted the occasional violence of man and nature. I had no problem with hunting for food. Nothing prepared me for the violence that I witnessed daily in Africa. I saw hundreds of these glorious animals killed, not for food, but for trophies. The experience changed me. In Africa, I had filmed death. I came home to America to film life. With my friend Clyde Lockwood, I headed for Arizona to look for the Sonoran Desert Pronghorn. We wanted to film every bird and mammal covered by the 1973 Endangered Species Act. How'd you do? I didn't see any antelope, but this area sure does have a lot of tracks. Yeah, I know, I saw four antelope. Really? Yeah, up the oh. valley. Three females and one baby, and they were running as fast as they could go. I guess you didn't have time to get your camera no, set up. No, no. I, I barely had time to jump up on top of the car and look at him. But I've been looking at this area, and there's more tracks in this area than anywhere else we've seen. That's right. Concentrated. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to take the big lens and sit right up on top of that lava flow. And I think just overlooking this area, just wait until some antelope show up. Sounds like a good plan. Well, it might work. But look at these tracks. Yeah. Just everywhere, the ground is punctured with them. This is the best feeding area we've seen too, I believe. Yeah, it is. Tracking is important, but we had also researched specifics about population and range. We had learned that about 75 of this pronghorn subspecies, the only remaining herd in America, lived here one of the rarest animals on the continent. They're also one of the shyest. So a telephoto lens was called for. Others, like the Quadi Mundi, were more approachable. Sonoran pronghorn had never been filmed before. If I was going to succeed, I had to think like one, or better yet, like a predator. I stayed downwind, moved slowly and quietly, and I set myself up in a good vantage point. Other animals were around. We saw a herd of desert bighorn sheep. Although the sheep were not what we were after, a good wildlife photographer will not pass up an opportunity. The desert requires certain precautions. To leave the camera overnight, I wrapped it for protection against blowing sand and morning dew. We were camped less than a mile north of the Mexican border a place called the Pinta Sands. In this land of contrasts, early morning and late afternoon were the best times for filming. Nighttime was also a special time for relaxing around the campfire. Weeks dragged by, but long waits and uncomfortable conditions, just like solitude, 
are part of photographing wildlife. I had done all my homework on pronghorn. I was in the right place, but I thought it might never be the right time. Then, just when we were ready to pack up, I spotted a pronghorn. Finally, the chance to roll some film had arrived. But after our six weeks in the desert, the footage was a disappointment, almost unusable because of the heat waves. Fortunately, many projects have much happier endings. I've learned the hard way that rare species do not necessarily yield rare footage. Now I look for uncommon or unseen behavior in common species. While out scouting one May, I find a hole, then a belted kingfisher. Surely there's a nest inside the burrow. Baby kingfishers, their sharp beaks tell me so. Exactly how many young ones there are, I cannot determine. However many there might be in the brood, I'll never be able to film them through the tiny opening. So hidden by a tarp, I dig into the burrow from behind. I must have shoveled a ton, ants and all. After three days, the opening is large enough to work in, but it's still too dark for filming. Luckily, the lights don't bother the baby birds too much. But just to get them more accustomed to the brightness and heat, I turn the lights off and on for short intervals. Next, I find some minnows and try to get the babies to accept the fish from me. Doing this sequence is like being back in Alaska. Here I am again, filming myself. My intrusion kept the parents away longer than normal, so I keep the youngsters healthy by feeding them regularly. I use another tool of the trade, a tent blind, on the other side of the river. Her babies are friendly, but the mother bird, understandably, is cautious and protective, so I have to be more careful when filming her. I know she'll dive many times a day, for fish to feed her young ones, and I position myself at a nearby pool to film the action.
the sequence of the mother feeding her babies is harder. Now I have to get her accustomed to the light. I don't blame her for backing out, but soon her maternal instinct overcomes her fear. up close and slow down. That's the way I like to watch and film wildlife. In this diving sequence, the camera is filming at 150 frames per second, compared to the normal 24. This is what the digging and waiting is all about. Getting a bird's eye view of a baby kingfisher swallowing its lunch. The funny part about watching and filming wildlife is that the books often talk about one kind of animal behavior while you see another. Often when you're out in the field, you'll see things that totally contradict what you've read. To me, this kind of personal discovery is very exciting. Experiences like these add greatly to the joy and adventure of getting closer to nature. As you can see, there are different approaches that have to be taken under different circumstances. There's no one secret to wildlife photography, but if I had to sum up the way that I go about it in one easy word, it would probably be angle. Look for an angle. Now by angle I mean look for a nest, look for a den, look for a, a food source like the grass that the pronghorn and the bighorn were coming to, or a, or a water source, the prey species come to the water and then the lion hunts there. Food, water, den, nest, it can even be something like an, like an animal, uh, a female of the species during the mating season. But whatever it is, the angle that I look for is something that an animal will return to time and time again. Now it's been my finding that only with an angle like that are you able to spend enough time around the animals to really get good coverage. Many people have an impression of wildlife photography that it, that it has to be very technical or that it's very time consuming. That's really not the case and, and that shouldn't put you off. It can be a fascinating hobby even with the most basic of equipment. And you also shouldn't be put off if you're not a biologist. I'm certainly not a biologist. I like to think of myself as a naturalist. I learn as I go. My actual background is in English and it taught me one other important thing that I think I should pass along and that is to be able to tell a good story. Whether you're taking two or three still photographs or whether you're setting out to do a whole one hour home movie, being able to tell a story with a good beginning, middle and end is extremely important. So if you do decide to get yourself a camera, 
Keep your eyes open for an angle and also for a storyline. I can only hope that you'll have as much fun as I've had photographing wildlife. I'm Marty Stauffer. Until next time, enjoy our wild America.